told you, and being back here really brings back a lot of memories. And when I started school, I didn't speak any English at all. I spoke only Chinese, of course. And it took a long time to figure out what was going on. In fact, it was well into the second grade before I really understood much, I think. And, and one story in particular, <laughs> one situation in particular I can remember where, um, you know, the, it was, this was during the Second World War when kids were asked to, uh, to bring tin cans to school. At the, um, these tin cans would somehow help the war effort bring the boys home from the Pacific and so forth. And each time the teacher asked us to bring tin cans to school you know, to, uh, for the collection, I, I didn't quite understand, I never understood until finally one day she held up a can, okay? And she, was, she said something that I took to be, bring tin cans tomorrow. And so I thought, aha, uh -huh. this time I've got it. This time I understood. And so I went to the restaurant because, as you know, we had these huge number, tin, ten, yeah, cans. Yeah, number 10 cans, right? And I thought, I'm going to make my mark today. And so I, I took all these cans. And soy sauce cans and <laughs> tomato cans and so forth, and I scrubbed them out, tore off the labels, flattened them and so forth, and then put them in a big gunny sack and schlepped them all the way to school, and thinking nobody, nobody is going to mm -hmm. bring as many tin cans as I. And then I got into the room, dragging this gunny sack full of uh, tin cans, and as soon as I got in the classroom, <laughs> I figured out, uh-oh. I screwed up because I could see by all the cans that the other kids had, it wasn't just tin cans, it was a specific kind. It was a Dutch cleanser can and we were collecting them somehow for some, you know, for some other reason, but the teacher um, took this bag of tin cans and she dumped them out on the floor and the kids laughed, and they laughed, and they laughed, and it was just so embarrassing. It was really embarrassing. Then I gathered them up and took them home, and that was my war effort. <laughs> <laughs> These incidents um, in school, one, one tends not to remember after a time. You, you learn enough English to make sense of things. Um, but the embarrassment of that early period remains. Unless teachers are really thinking about uh, whether children who don't understand uh, the, the language you're using um, can figure out what is going on by the things they do, uh, the, the children who don't speak English will have a very difficult time um, you know, figuring out what is wanted. It, I think it was, this was in about the second grade, late in the second grade. There was this spring play and it took place right here in this courtyard and all the kids were in it. They were in the chorus singing songs mm -hmm. or they were dressed up like little birds and, and elves and, and, and all kinds of little animals. And the only children who were not involved in this play were the non-English speakers, you know, namely me and the, the Mexican children in the class. And you know, I've, I've thought so often about this, about how we could have participated. We understood enough to have followed the instructions. And I, I, I'm, it makes me very sad that in so many places, uh, the assumption is that if you don't speak English, then you really can't participate. And the, the, um, you know, the, the feeling of being left out is really very, very um, difficult. When your language isn't spoken at school, um, you're not given any kind of access to the nuances of meaning. Uh, and there's so much that's going on that you don't really understand. 
um, that you can't fully participate in, uh, that you can't um, be yourself in. And I, I think that that's probably the most difficult thing is to know that somehow, because of not understanding the language, you are an outsider. You don't really belong. Um, and the, the, the feelings that children have of being on the outside, of not being included, um, can be very difficult uh, for them. Now, the real problem in living in a society where, uh, where differences, linguistic differences, cultural differences are not appreciated is that children come to feel that the only language that is valued is the one spoken by people at school and in, in the society. And very often what happens to children um, in these situations is that as they learn English, they give up using the language that the parents speak. Now, this, this happened uh, with my sisters, especially, because they were so young when they first encountered English. I was lucky. I was eight when I first learned English. Uh, but my sisters, my two younger sisters, were three and four when they first uh, were put in an English-speaking situation. They, this was during the war. My mother was working. She put them in a daycare center, uh, one of the first daycare centers in, in California, in fact. Uh, and there they learned English. And because they were just in the pro process of learning their first language, Chinese, they gave it up almost immediately. And so neither of my sisters ever learned Chinese well enough to communicate easily uh, with uh, our mother in a mature way about anything of much depth. Um, and this, this tragedy is repeated again and again but these days. Uh, with the emphasis on putting young, limited English uh, children in early childhood programs for the purpose of teaching them English so that we won't have to bother with uh, doing this once they're in school. Uh, we find that a great many children are losing their mother tongues and are unable to communicate with parents, which can be a tremendous problem for them because children don't just learn what they're supposed to learn in school. The parents have something to teach them, too. They have a great deal to teach them. They, they teach them values uh, about uh, what people in the, the particular group uh, value and respect. And the, the problem when children don't speak the same language as their parents when they lose that language early in life is that the parents can't really teach them these things. And so you get a break. You get an alienation between parents and children. And as the children grow older, these problems can be quite severe. What did you like about being in a bilingual program? Um, I like it a lot because <coughs> you could talk a lot with your friends when you was little, you couldn't talk with your friends. And if you are bilingual, you could have more friends. Yep. And sometimes when my grandma had to go to the stores and, and they don't know English, I have to translate it. So there is a real value in children uh, keeping their, the language of their parents, uh, being able to talk to them, um, keeping a close uh, affiliation with the primary community of the family. And in, in this society, the sad thing is that um, learning English does not always result in bilingualism. Instead, 
the more usual thing that happens is that children shift in their language loyalties. They, they shift and then they give up the use of the mother tongue, in which case they end up being um, monolinguals of a different sort. There is no teacher going into the teaching force now, near the end of the 20th century, in the state of California or anywhere else in this country, who will not be dealing with children who don't speak English fully when they come into the classroom. Teachers need to understand the differences in children's experiences to appreciate what those differences will result in and to understand that in order to make to help all children learn uh, they need to be welcoming and to be appreciative of the the worlds of experience that the children are bringing with them into the classroom and these are examples of interactive journals. The children write in their native language. That's great. They're becoming literate in their native language first. Uh -huh. They can use inventive spelling. I feel that children shouldn't be limited by their inability to spell correctly in order to communicate. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The teacher has one of the most responsible positions I can think of in a society. Now the, the children who are in their classes are going to grow up and they're going to be leaders. They're going to be dealing with all of the problems in the society. They either make it or they don't. But what, what it takes to survive, what it's going to take to survive as a citizen in the 21st century is going to go way beyond just knowing how to read and write, to speak English, to compute, and to do all the other things that we th think of as being a part of the school's curriculum. The kids are going to have to learn to live together in a diverse society. They're going to have to know how to handle the kinds of prejudices that we have lived with and that we take for granted almost. They're going to have to know how to deal with a world that is becoming increasingly smaller. They're going to have to know how to understand where other people are coming from. They're going to have to be citizens of a multicultural world.